William Ewart Gladstone was a British liberal politician. In a career lasting over 60 years, he served as Prime Minister four separate times, more than any other person, and served as Chancellor of the Exchequer four times. Gladstone was also Britain's oldest Prime Minister. He resigned for the final time when he was 84 years old. Gladstone first entered Parliament in 1832. Beginning as a high Tory, Gladstone served in the cabinet of Sir Robert Peel. As Chancellor Gladstone became committed to low public spending and to electoral reform, earning him the sobriquet, the People's William. Gladstone's first ministry saw many reforms including disestablishment of the Church of Ireland and the introduction of secret voting. After his electoral defeat in 1874, Gladstone resigned as leader of the Liberal Party. But from 1876 began a comeback based on opposition to Turkey's Bulgarian atrocities. Gladstone's Midlothian campaign of 1879-80 was an early example of many modern political campaigning techniques. After the 1880 election, he formed his second ministry, which saw crises in Egypt and in Ireland, where the government passed repressive measures but also improved the legal rights of Irish tenant farmers. The government also passed the Third Reform Act. Back in office in early 1886, Gladstone proposed Irish Home Rule but this was defeated in the House of Commons in July. The resulting split in the Liberal Party helped keep them out of office, with one short break, for 20 years. In 1892 Gladstone formed his last government at the age of 82. The second Irish Home Rule Bill passed the Commons but was defeated in the Lords in 1893. Gladstone resigned in March 1894, in opposition to increased naval expenditure. He left Parliament in 1895 and died three years later aged 88. Gladstone is famous for his oratory, his religiosity, his liberalism, his rivalry with the conservative leader Benjamin Disraeli, and for his poor relations with Queen Victoria, who once complained. He always addresses me as if I were a public meeting. Gladstone was known affectionately by his supporters as the People's William or the G.O.M. Gladstone is consistently ranked as one of Britain's greatest prime ministers. Early life Born in 1809 in Liverpool, at 62 Rodney Street, William Ewart Gladstone was the fourth son of the merchant Sir John Gladstone, and his second wife, Anne Mackenzie Robertson. Although born and brought up in Liverpool, William Gladstone was of purely Scottish ancestry. One of his earliest childhood memories was being made to stand on a table and say, ladies and gentlemen, to the assembled audience probably at a gathering to promote the election of George Canning as MP for Liverpool in 1812. In 1814 young Willie visited Scotland for the first time, as he and his brother John travelled with their father to Edinburgh, Bigger and Dingwall to visit their relatives. William and his brother were both made freemen of the borough of Dingwall. In 1815 Gladstone also travelled to London and Cambridge for the first time with his parents. In London he attended a service of thanksgiving with his family at St. Paul's Cathedral following the Battle of Waterloo, where he saw the Prince Regent. William Gladstone was educated from 1816 to 1821 at a preparatory school at the Vicarage of St. Thomas's Church at Seaforth, close to his family's residence, Seaforth House. In 1821 William followed in the footsteps of his older brothers and attended Eton College before matriculating in 1828 at Christ Church, Oxford, where he read classics and mathematics, although he had no great interest in mathematics. In December 1831 he achieved the double first-class degree he had long desired. Gladstone served as president of the Oxford Union Debating Society, where he developed a reputation as an orator, which followed him into the House of Commons. At university Gladstone was a Tory and denounced Whig proposals for parliamentary reform. Following the success of his double first, William travelled with his brother John on a grand tour of Europe, visiting Belgium, France, Germany and Italy. On his return to England, William was elected to Parliament in 1832 as Tory Member of Parliament for Newark. 
partly through the influence of the local patron, the Duke of Newcastle. Although Gladstone entered Lincoln's Inn in 1833, with a view to becoming a barrister, by 1839 he had requested that his name should be removed from the list because he no longer intended to be called to the bar. In the House of Commons, Gladstone was initially a disciple of high Toryism, opposing the abolition of slavery and factory legislation. In 1834, when slavery was abolished, he helped his father obtain £106,769 in official reimbursement by the government for the 2,508 slaves he owned across nine plantations in the Caribbean. In December 1834 he was appointed as a junior Lord of the Treasury in Sir Robert Peel's first ministry. The following month he was appointed Under Secretary of State for War and the Colonies an office he held until the government's resignation in April 1835. William Gladstone's early attempts to find a wife proved unsuccessful, with his being rejected by Caroline Eliza Farquhar in 1835, and by Lady Frances Harriet Douglas in 1837. Gladstone published his first book, The State and Its Relations with the Church, in 1838 in which he argued that the goal of the state should be to promote and defend the interests of the Church of England. The following year, having met her in 1834 at the London home of old Etonian friend and then fellow Conservative MP James Milnes Gaskell, he married Catherine Glynn, to whom he remained married until his death 59 years later. They had eight children together, William Henry Gladstone, MP, Agnes Gladstone, later Mrs. Edward Wickham, the Rev. Stephen Edward Gladstone, Catherine Jesse Gladstone, Mary Gladstone, later Mrs. Harry Drew, Helen Gladstone, Vice President of Newnham College, Cambridge, Henry Neville Gladstone, Lord Gladstone of Harden, Herbert John Gladstone, MP and Viscount Gladstone, Gladstone's eldest son William and youngest, Herbert, both became members of Parliament. The former predeceased his father. In 1840 Gladstone began to rescue and rehabilitate London prostitutes walking the streets of London himself and encouraging the women he encountered to change their ways. Much to the criticism of his peers, he continued this practice decades later, even after he was elected Prime Minister. Opposition to the opium wars The opium trade faced intense opposition from Gladstone. Gladstone called it most infamous and atrocious, referring to the opium trade between China and British India in particular. Gladstone was fiercely against both of the opium wars Britain waged in China. In the first opium war initiated in 1840 and the second opium war initiated in 1857, denouncing British violence against Chinese, and was ardently opposed to the British trade in opium in China. Gladstone lambasted it as Palmerston's Opium War, and said that he felt in dread of the judgments of God upon England for our national iniquity towards China. In May 1840, a famous speech was made by Gladstone in Parliament against the First Opium War. Gladstone criticized it as a war more unjust in its origin, a war more calculated in its progress to cover this country with permanent disgrace. His hostility to opium stemmed from the effects of opium brought upon his sister Helen. Due to the first opium war brought on by Palmerston, there was initial reluctance to join the government appeal on the part of Gladstone before 1841. William Gladstone's private secretary was his nephew Spencer Littleton, minister under Peel. Gladstone was re-elected in 1841. In September 1842 he lost the forefinger of his left hand in an accident while reloading a gun. Thereafter he wore a glove or finger sheath. In the second ministry of Robert Peel he served as president of the Board of Trade. Gladstone became concerned with the situation of coal whippers. These were the men who worked on London docks, whipping, in baskets from ships to barges or wharves all incoming coal from the sea. They were called up and relieved through public houses and therefore a man could not get this job unless he possessed the favourable opinion of the publican, who looked upon most favourably those who drank. 
The man's name was written down and the score followed. Publicans issued employment solely on the capacity of the man to pay, and men often left the pub to work drunk. They spent the savings on drink to secure the favorable opinion of publicans and therefore further employment. Gladstone passed the Coal Vendors Act 1843 to set up a central office for employment. When this act expired in 1856 a select committee was appointed by the Lords in 1857 to look into the question. Gladstone gave evidence to the committee. I approached the subject in the first instance as I think everyone in Parliament of necessity did, with the strongest possible prejudice against the proposal to interfere, but the facts stated were of so extraordinary and deplorable a character that it was impossible to withhold attention from them. Then the question being whether legislative interference was required I was at length induced to look at a remedy of an extraordinary character as the only one I thought applicable to the case. It was a great innovation. Looking back in 1883, Gladstone wrote that, in principle, perhaps my coal whippers act of 1843 was the most socialistic measure of the last half century. He resigned in 1845 over the Maynooth Seminary issue, a matter of conscience for him. Gladstone, who previously argued in a book that a Protestant country should not pay money to other churches, supported the increase in the Maynooth grant and voted for it in Commons, but resigned rather than face charges that he had compromised his principles to remain in office. After accepting Gladstone's resignation, Peel confessed to a friend, I really have great difficulty sometimes in exactly comprehending what he means. Gladstone returned to Peel's government as colonial secretary in December 1845. As such, he had to stand for re-election, but the strong protectionism of the Duke of Newcastle, his patron in Newark, meant that he could not stand there and no other seat was available. Throughout the Corn Law Crisis of 1846, therefore, Gladstone was in the highly anomalous and possibly unique position of being a Secretary of State without a seat in either House and thus unanswerable to Parliament, Opposition MP. The following year Peel's government fell over the MP's repeal of the Corn Laws and Gladstone followed his leader into a course of separation from mainstream conservatives. After Peel's death in 1850 Gladstone emerged as the leader of the Peelites in the House of Commons. He was re-elected for the University of Oxford at the general election in 1847. Peel had once held this seat but had lost it because of his espousal of Catholic emancipation in 1829. Gladstone became a constant critic of Lord Palmerston. In 1847 Gladstone helped to establish Glenarmond College, then the Holy and Undivided Trinity College at Glenarmond. The school was set up as an Episcopal foundation to spread the ideas of the Anglican Church in Scotland, and to educate the sons of the gentry. As a young man Gladstone had treated his father's estate, Fusk, in Fifarsha, southwest of Aberdeen, as home, but as a younger son he would not inherit it. Instead, from the time of his marriage, he lived at his wife's family's estate at Harden in Flintshire, Wales. He never actually owned Harden, which belonged first to his brother-in-law Sir Stephen Glynn, and was then inherited by Gladstone's eldest son in 1874. During the late 1840s, when he was out of office, he worked extensively to turn Harden into a viable business. In 1848 he also founded the Church Penitentiary Association for the Reclamation of Fallen Women. In May 1849 he began his most active rescue work with fallen women and met prostitutes late at night on the street, in his house or in their houses, writing their names in a private notebook. He aided the House of Mercy at Cluo near Windsor and spent much time arranging employment for ex-prostitutes. In a declaration, signed on 7 December 1896 and only to be opened after his death by his son, Stephen, Gladstone wrote, with reference to rumours which I believe were at one time afloat, though I know not with what degree of currency, and also with reference to the times when I shall not be here to answer for myself, I desire to record my solemn declaration and assurance. 
as in the sight of God and before his judgment seat, that at no period of my life have I been guilty of the act which is known as that of infidelity to the marriage bed. In 1927, during a court case over published claims that he had had improper relationships with some of these women, the jury unanimously found that the evidence completely vindicated the high moral character of the late Mr. W. E. Gladstone. In 1850, 51st Gladstone visited Naples for the benefit of his daughter Mary's eyesight. Giacomo Lacaita, legal advisor to the British Embassy, was imprisoned by the Neapolitan government, as were other political dissidents. Gladstone became concerned at the political situation in Naples and the arrest and imprisonment of Neapolitan liberals. In February 1851 the government allowed Gladstone to visit the prisons where they were held and he deplored their condition. In April and July he published two letters to the Earl of Aberdeen against the Neapolitan government and responded to his critics in an examination of the official reply of the Neapolitan government in 1852. Gladstone's first letter described what he saw in Naples as the negation of God erected into a system of government. Justino Fortunato, Prime Minister of the Kingdom of the Two Sicilies, knew of the letters from Paolo Ruffo, Neapolitan ambassador in London, but he didn't inform the King Ferdinand II. After his unfulfillment, Fortunato was dismissed by the Sovereign, Chancellor of the Exchequer. In 1852, following the appointment of Lord Aberdeen as Prime Minister, head of a coalition of Whigs and P. Lights, Gladstone became Chancellor of the Exchequer. The Whigs said Charles Wood and the Tory Disraeli had both been perceived to have failed in the office and so this provided Gladstone with a great political opportunity. His first budget in 1853 almost completed the work begun by Peel 11 years before in simplifying Britain's tariff of duties and customs. 123 duties were abolished and 133 duties were reduced. The income tax had legally expired but Gladstone proposed to extend it for seven years to fund tariff reductions. We propose, then, to re-enact it for two years, from April, 1853, to April, 1855, at the rate of 7d. In the pound, from April, 1855, to enact it for two more years at 6d, in the pound, and then for three years more, from April, 1857, at 5d, under this proposal, on the 5th of April, 1860, the income tax will by law expire. Gladstone wanted to maintain a balance between direct and indirect taxation. He also wished to abolish the income tax. He knew that its abolition depended on a considerable retrenchment in government expenditure. He therefore increased the number of people eligible to pay it by lowering the threshold from £150 to £100. The more people who paid income tax, Gladstone believed, the more the public would pressure the government into abolishing it. Gladstone argued that the £100 line was the dividing line between the educated and the labouring part of the community, and that therefore the income tax payers and the electorate were to be the same people, who would then vote to cut government expenditure. The budget speech, at nearly five hours' length, raised Gladstone, at once to the front rank of financiers as of orators. H.C. G. Matthew has written that Gladstone made finance and figures exciting, and succeeded in constructing budget speeches epic in form and performance, often with lyrical interludes to vary the tension in the commons as the careful exposition of figures and argument was brought to a climax. The contemporary diarist Charles Greville wrote of Gladstone's speech, By universal consent it was one of the grandest displays and most able financial statement that ever was heard in the House of Commons, a great scheme, boldly, skillfully, and honestly devised, disdaining popular clamour and pressure from without, and the execution of it absolute perfection. Even those who do not admire the budget, or who are injured by it, admit the merit of the performance. It has raised Gladstone to a great political elevation, and, what is of far greater consequence than the measure itself, 
has given the country assurance of a man equal to great political necessities, and fit to lead parties and direct governments. However, with Britain entering the Crimean War in February 1854, Gladstone introduced his second budget on 6 March. Gladstone had to increase expenditure on the services and a vote of credit of £1,250,000 was taken to send a 25,000-strong force to the east. The deficit for the year would be £2,840,000. Gladstone refused to borrow the money needed to rectify this deficit, and instead increased the income tax by one half from seven pence to ten pence halfpenny in the pound. Gladstone proclaimed that the expenses of a war are the moral check which it has pleased the Almighty to impose on the ambition and the lust of conquest that are inherent in so many nations. By May £6,870,000 was needed to finance the war and so Gladstone introduced another budget on 8 May. Gladstone raised the income tax from 10.5 pence to 14d. To raise £3,250,000, spirits, malt, and sugar were taxed to raise the rest of the money needed. He served until 1855, a few weeks into Lord Palmerston's first premiership. Whereupon he resigned along with the rest of the Peelites after a motion was passed to appoint a committee of inquiry into the conduct of the war.